Today we're going to be talking about an extremely profound topic, the psychology of human survival, and in fact, explicitly, the psychology of the survival of the human race. My guest, Dr. Roger Walsh, is a psychiatrist and a professor at the University of California and also the author of a very interesting book called Staying Alive. Roger, welcome. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here. In your book, you look at the big problems facing humanity, global nuclear war, uh, pollution, overpopulation, and you come to a very interesting conclusion. You, you suggest that all of these po problems are man-made. They reflect our minds, our, our psyches, and that certainly one angle for resolving or for dealing with these problems then has to be psychological. What got you involved in, in these issues? So many people really don't want to face the big problems. That's true, and it's really quite understandable. If you look at the magnitude and urgency and complexity of the problems we're up against, it's really no surprise that most of us feel pretty uncomfortable when we look at them. And yet, when we're brought face to face with them, it's really hard to keep the veils of denial and repression up. And for me, the veils were torn away when I went to Asia. I spent a couple of months there studying and doing mm -hmm. research. And although I thought I knew about the state of the world, it was really quite a shock to me to find out firsthand just how most of the people in the world live and to live with these people and just from day to day yeah. see the conditions which they were surviving under. You know, I had a discussion with a spiritual teacher, Idri Shah, Sufi uh -huh. yeah, master, mm -hmm. about this issue was over 10 years ago. And I, I said to him, you know, at this point, we have to wake up. We have to become enlightened. We have to change. It's a matter of survival. And he said, yes, that's absolutely true. But if you put it to people that way, it won't work. You can't, that's not the reason that people are going to wake up. Mm -hmm. What was his suggestion as to why people would? Well, I don't know, listen to Sufi stories. I don't know uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> quite what he had in mind there. Well, I'm a little more. You're pragmatic. putting it more directly, aren't you? Yeah. Well, I think I think it's very possible that that the situation might evoke from us more mature responses. You know, mm -hmm. there are two ways, two things that could happen out of this because these threats have really strong effects on us. I mean, mm -hmm. we can deny and repress all we want, but there's no way we can escape completely the effects of the fact that our lives hang by a thread and we have no guarantee that any of us or our culture or our friends or our loved ones are going to be here tomorrow. That has major effects. And what that means is we could go two ways. On the one hand, we could, the, the very threats we've created could exacerbate the fear and paranoia and defensiveness that got us here in the first place. Yeah. Or on the other hand, if a sufficient number of us are really willing to face these honestly and act appropriately, then we might be able to reverse the situation and even perhaps learn and grow in the, in the process. Because it's going to take more than we've had before. It's going to take new levels of individual and collective responsibility and maturity and growth and collective action. And so it's just possible that the th very threats we've created might act as catalysts to pull us out yeah. of the situation. That's that, our hope, that's I think. That's the optimistic view. That's the optimistic that, view. As in a Shakespearean tragedy, it will bring out the noblest. Yeah. And yeah. of course, the reality is we don't know. Yeah. We don't know that we're going to survive. We have no guarantees whatsoever. But it doesn't seem to be much sense to do anything except work like hell to mm. ensure that we do. Yeah. You know, what you have done, and I certainly want to go into this in, in some detail, is you've analyzed the situation psychologically using the various schools of psychology and what they can offer, from behaviorism all the way to transpersonal and the spiritual aspects of psychology. And yet there are those who suggest that the problem isn't really psychological quite, or th they suggest what we really have to come to terms with is the problem of evil itself. Uh, how do you address that? Well, I think we need to take a real close look at what we mean by evil. Mm -hmm. And you can look at unskillful behavior, behavior which causes incredible suffering to people, either in terms of evil and malevolence, yeah. or you can look at it in terms of it being an expression of people's mistaken beliefs and fears and paranoia. Uh -huh. And it's very interesting, you know, what, what comes up for you when you hear the words evil? Well, one thinks of, you know, the religious mythologies and, and Satan or the notion of mm. absolute evil battled, locked, you know, like day yep. and night. And That's it. 
And yeah. when, when there's evil, then p the automatic response is to attack and defend and feel very righteous about it. Mm -hmm. So what I'd suggest is that seeing people acting in terms of evil is very dangerous because w the one of the sad facts of human nature is that we tend to become what we believe our enemies are mm -hmm. and to justify our actions in terms of this. So if we see mm -hmm. them as evil, then we're likely to respond appropriate yeah. in the same way. Well, ourselves. the classical example of this would be the Inquisition, where the church right. uh, tortured and killed 10 million people in in the name of uh, Jesus, and to, because they were evil. Yeah, for their own good, for yeah. the good of their souls. Uh -huh. <laughs> and and yet this notion of evil, which you you seem to be challenging in a very intelligent fashion, is is embodied in uh, most of the major religious traditions today. It is at some levels, and yet some of the more sophisticated te religious mm -hmm. teachings tend to see unskillful behavior more in terms of an expression of people's fear and mm -hmm. defensiveness and try to heal that yes. rather than trying to attack and destroy mm -hmm. the person who has it. So one of the things that you're saying is that our tendency to label the, the, the problems that we're having as resulting from evil in the world, that in itself is uh, an illustration of part of the problem yep. from a psychological perspective. Yeah, and a, a very tricky one too, uh -huh. because we can feel so righteous when we're battling evil. Yeah. We always, we, we're on the side of light. And it's always interesting, you know, if you, you look over history, everyone always thinks they're on the side of the light and angels, and no one's ever kind of fighting for the devil. Mm -hmm. Well, are you, are you saying that awareness is enough? That, that if we're aware of the fact that we only look towards short-term reinforcements, that that will actually change? Well, awareness is healing. There's no uh -huh. question about that. I'm uh -huh. not sure it's enough by itself. The behaviorists would probably not say so, I would right, think. Right, exactly. Some other schools might, but yeah. I don't think anyone would argue with the idea that awareness is crucial to we healing both the individual, the culture, and the planet. And it may be our, our best point of leverage. It may indeed. Yeah. It may be that uh, one of the best things any of us can do, I think, is to educate ourselves, to educate other people, just to know the facts. Mm -hmm. Because that once we know the facts, that evokes, tends to evoke appropriate responses. Yeah. So we just need, the first step is always education. H.G. Mm -hmm. Wells said it very well. He said, human history is becoming more and more a race between education and catastrophe. And that's very mm -hmm. true now, more true than when he said it. And if we were to look at education today in a kind of its optimal sense, what I think we'd be needing to do is to give people a whole perspective of what's really happening in the, in the largest possible sense. That's right. We really, we really would need to be giving more courses about the global situation, the whole planet, the, the state of our world. There are very few courses like that in colleges or schools at the moment, but they're getting more. Mm -hmm. And that's very hopeful that uh, the education is beginning to shift. I see it in the University of California where I work, and I feel encouraged by that. Now, as a psychiatrist, what about our understanding of the unconscious dynamics of, of the mind? You know, Freud, I think, was seemed rather hopeless about the human situation because he saw all this muck, uh, mm -hmm. aggression, libido, and, and so on going on in the unconscious. How, how do you deal with that? Yeah, well, Freud was uh, a little bit of a pessimist about the human condition. I'm not sure I'd want to agree completely with that. I think the reality is all of us have the potential for uh, positive and negative, and, and we react according to circumstances, environment, upbringing, etc. So we're a lot more malleable, changeable, than perhaps Freud would have wanted to uh, believe. Mm -hmm. So that gives me me more hope. But the clearly unconscious factors play a large role. For example, the role of fear operates unconsciously and, and we respond to our fears by what we call defense mechanisms whereby we, for example, repress and deny our awareness yeah. of the situation or we project onto other people those parts of ourselves and those motives we're unwilling to recognize and acknowledge in ourselves. So, then, for example, we turn out to be lily white and they turn out mm -hmm. to be evil and malevolent and bad and vicious and all the things that we're not. What do the spiritual psychologies, if you can tell us in about a minute, have to say uh, about these issues? Perhaps we can conclude on that note. Well, let's see. They, I, th I think the spiritual psychologies would point, uh, some of the Eastern psychologies would point to the role, for example, of of greed or addiction mm -hmm. and hatred and anger and of what they call delusion, that is not seeing clearly yeah. that the appreciation that our mistaken beliefs and defenses 
distort our perception of one another and of all other nature. But nations. In other words, by not being in touch with our deepest, truest self, we're, we're acting out of, out of false values. That puts it very nicely. Yeah, that's good. Uh -huh. That's very good. This has been Thinking Aloud, a production of Spectrum Foundation.